Always fix it. Yeah. Hi, YouTube. They're watching mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. video here and waiting for Facebook to, to go live. Always. Uh, we always yeah. wait for Facebook. Yeah. Uh, there it is. Oh, yep. Just got there the it is. blue light here. So, yeah, we're good. Uh, yeah, it, it dinged on me. It's amazing. I always hear that ding, and I know mm -hmm. Facebook is on. Yeah. Just letting you know. Uh, just doing that. Letting me know that I can I can watch it if I want. Mm -hmm. Let me see. Let me grab my phone here. And one minute coming up. One minute until showtime. Yeah, boy, she's loud. Um, okay, Facebook. Mm. Where are you? Should be at the top. It's not at the top. Huh. What well, ding. But it's <laughs> taking its sweet old time to show on itself. 30 here. seconds. Dun, 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 dun. There. There. All About Wine is now live. Just now. Just now it says. Wow. Probably has the... But it <laughs> dinged a little bit ago. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That is coughing. Yeah, it's oh, a delay because it I, I just heard me say live. Yep. Five seconds. Well. Your show will go live in five seconds. <laughs> Four, three, two, one. One. Log Talk Radio. There we go. This is all about wine the talk show dedicated to the wine. wine industry since 2009 featuring winemaker cellar master vineyardist and tasting expert ron basically what we're trying to do on this program is just trying to educate people and trying to make wine less confusing and more friendly from coast to coast and around the world you know we really have had some some neat people on the program i i just i love that post your questions and comments during the live show on our facebook page at www.facebook.com forward slash all about wine btr again that's www.facebook.com forward slash all about wine btr and now all about wine is on wine here's is ron on. People. When the bus people are happy. They're happy because they're being able to listen to the show before this weekend. Mm -hmm. This weekend. We are going to have uh, winter upon us again. Winter. Oh. Yeah. Well, it's anyway. going to be. Oh, well, yeah. I don't know why that thing just beeped. Hmm. Um. Uh, it will be cold here in Florida this weekend. I mean, all of you people up north and everywhere else is ha, 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 cold. Yeah, it will be cold here in Florida. Mm -hmm. We have a front coming in, the same one that's dumping all that snow up in New England and on the East Coast. The tail of it is wiggling down in Florida and giving us some cold weather. It's supposed to be uh, in no higher than in the mid upper forties on Saturday here in Tampa and sun, uh, Saturday night, it's supposed to get down to the low thirties, possibly freezing in the areas. So mm -hmm. we are bundling up and getting ready for it. And, uh, we'll, we'll stay hunkered down <laughs> just like in the, Hurricane, we stay hunkered down. We're going to hunker down in this cold snap here. Yep. I got to bring a couple of plants inside, though, and there's most of them will survive, but there's a couple of them that will not. So mm. I need to move those, but otherwise, I'm as ready for it as I will ever be. Mm. Yeah. Well, I hope so. People who say, oh, I miss the cold weather. Mm. Yeah, you're going to get a hit of it now. You yeah. can. See how much you miss it. Yeah. 
Yeah, I talked good. to my daughter who lives in Ogden, Utah, and she says, oh, I love the cold weather. And I said, oh, good for you. That's why you live in Ogden, Utah. But uh, I don't. We, we live in Florida to get away from all that freezing cold weather, and we're going to get it this weekend. Well, I sound like I'm whining, and I am. Because uh, it's all about wine. <laughs> yes, it's all about wine. <laughs> But I got a couple of things to tell you about some ice wine today, which is cold weather. So uh, that would be a good segue if I had those articles pulled up, but I don't. Uh, but uh, yeah, we'll we'll survive, and we'll be back here next week. Actually, we'll be back here next month because it will be one to third or something like that. I think next Thursday. Let's see. First, second, or fourth? First, no, third. So, yeah. Well, okay. I'm I'm rambling. I know that. We got some stuff to tell you about tonight, as always, some interesting things and all that. Mike's not talking too much. Mike has, as you know, if you listen to us, has been under the weather for like a month now. But he's pretty much over except for a cough that just sort of jumps in at inopportune times and... He starts coughing, and it's just a, a a dry cough, but enough to be irritating. So yeah. we'll keep him from talking, and just let him <laughs> try to subdue and suppress his cough. Oh, hey, 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 come on! <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> bus people, bus people like that. You know? okay. So. <laughs> uh, but uh yeah he's he's for those of you who are concerned about mike's health he is doing better except for this cough and which is to drive him crazy like he told me before the show see the doctor reasonably soon and hopefully the doctor will give him something for it instead of just saying yeah well that's a cough it'll go away and uh, just let it wait until it goes away yeah that's it. so okay So, if, though, you want to jump in there, Mike, jump in any time, as always. I always appreciate your your input on anything that you happen to find while I'm talking about stuff. Yeah. I'm always looking up things. and That's... Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you are. And, you know, that's, that's good. It helps me, you know... Try to research. Help, helps me keep... Yeah. You do the silent research back there. That's good. So... Good. So some, sometimes when I call on you, though, you're in the middle of something, and and so I, I disturb you from that. But it reminds me of the TV reporters out in the field where the studio says, and how are you? And then you have this delay because they don't get it right oh, away. Oh, yeah. So. It is a delay. Yeah. 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 There's a delay between so us. Now they're starting to, hmm. yeah, they're starting to show the, the station logo. And then they jump back to them, so it doesn't look a little weird there. Yeah. Oh, okay. Castle Ridge Winery up in Iowa. They are doing their annual Valentine's celebration. They have chocolate, and they have a, uh, a Sweetheart Rosé, uh, which is one of the bottles that they've bottled this week. It comes in a heart shaped bottle really a pretty cute bottle and they also are offering chocolate sticks and different things like that uh the sweetheart's rosé is a unique bottle classic bottle that they they do every year and it's it's really a pretty bottle so uh they've got that coming up also wine and pasta night uh by reservation they're doing that wine tastings by reservation only they are open though which surprised me i i was thinking they were closing in the winter but i guess they're open now the tasting bar is not open though but masks are required to come in if you have it uh an appointment and then you get seated and you get served the wines that uh, uh five wines i think they have and also get bread and cheese and all that. it's pretty nice tasting i've been there and it's it's really uh pretty well presented tasting and 
50% off shipping with a 12 bottle purchase. So they're getting ready for New Year and they uh, have, uh, I'm sorry, I was reading this. Uh, seating uh, is available, like I say, with reservations, and they got their uh, uh, different meals coming up and all that. If you live in Iowa, Arizona, California, Colorado, Florida, Minnesota, Missouri, Texas, and Washington, D.C., they can ship to you. Anywhere else, uh, they can't. So you can get a hold of them at Tassel Ridge Winery, T A S S L E R E L. Ridge, R-I-D-G-E, Winery, and uh, check out their website and check out uh, what they have to offer. You can sign up for their e-letter, and uh, nice place. Uh, they got some nice wines there and uh, some great people. So, Tassel Ridge Winery, but their uh, Valentine Rosé is really a, a unique bottle and a unique presentation. And let's see, I had something. Uh, oh, Wine Folly. Wine Folly is offering a French wine online course. They're saying French is one of the most important wine producing countries in the world and is home to the most iconic and noteworthy wines on the planet, which basically they are. Pump up your French wine knowledge with the newest Wine Folly digital course hosted by Madeline Puckett. And she is uh, the... Um, the person of wine folly and master of wine, Christine Marsiglio. So you can go to winefolly.com and uh, W I N E F O L L Y, winefolly.com, and check out the online French wine course. I haven't signed up for you, but I think I might do that just simply because it uh, it's always good to. Expand your knowledge, do stuff like this, and pick up some more information. You never know. There's always stuff out there that you don't always know. So winefolly.com and get yourself some education on French wine. Okay. Now, bits of news here. California wine industry lost more than $250 million in value due to the port disruptions. Wow. We've... Now, what is this? Well, that's a friend of mine. I'm going to have to... I have to hang him up. Okay. Um, I usually don't... He usually knows better than to call it this time because of the show and he called. Wow. Uh, all right. The uh, California wine industry has lost more than $250 uh, value last summer because of the supply chain disruption. It's a new study, a new economic report has said uh, the uh, study by UC Davis said that agricultural exports fell by $2.1 billion from May to September. And because of having difficulty obtaining shipping containers, and that's about a 17%. Well, you're going to hear it ring, and then he's going to go to voicemail. That's about a 17% decrease, and it exceeded losses from the 2018 trade war with China. So it's big amount, big amount that they lost. Couldn't find shipping containers, and so they... Yeah, he's going to go to... Okay, thank you. My engineer just came in and took took it, and she, she heard it, and so she could came be, in and took it. Could me. be something important. We could play uh, the jazz music while you get that. Mute your microphone. And, while you get that. Yeah, you know, just, yeah I'll yeah, call him back good. afterwards. He's not going to go anywhere. Okay. He might be calling me about the about the game tomorrow. Maybe it might be called off. I'm mm. just going to play golf tomorrow, but that... You know, maybe there might be an issue. So I don't know. Might not be playing golf tomorrow. So I hope not. I enjoy getting out there. But I'll give him a call back afterward. Um, so uh, bad news, and that's just that's just the tip of it. It's still ongoing, and that's just from the uh, what is it, the fourth quarter. 
May through September, so third quarter of last year, $2.1 billion in a quarter of loss. Uh, wow. So they uh, obviously are hurting in this shipping because of this stuff. Okay, uh, let's see. I have other stuff on this page. Uh, oh, yes, this is the one that I really was interested in passing on to you. Russian wine. We don't talk about Russian wine. We never have, I don't believe. And in the many years we've been on, uh, from actually we keep saying 2009, but we actually had shows before then. And in all the years that we've been on, we have not talked about Russian wine. Hmm. And you know, who's the fault but me? Because I never consider Russian wine. Well, I've got some stuff to tell you here about Russian wine and the Russian industry. I'll be quoting some of this. I'll be telling you about some of it and all that. So Russia grows grapes. They grow a lot of grapes. And they have enough bulk to produce three-quarters of the wine and brandy labeled as Russian. But they still get grapes in from other places. And despite recent legislation, it's not clear where the remaining 25% come from. <laughs> the picture is even further complicated because of the spirits and wine production in Russia. Now, this is out of uh, Menninger's Wine Business International. So this is my source of this. It says scarcely a day passes without its president hitting the international headlines, you know, uh, Putin. And a speech by Putin back in December, on December 16th, received less attention. In it, he instructed the Russian government to gradually increase the minimum portion of Russian wine in the ranges of retail chains and restaurants, including through their priority offerings. Okay, now, the president takes interest in the wines in that country, uh, probably a lot more than, than any other president in any other country. A year after the annexation of Crimea, uh, this, which is where the home of Ukraine's finest vineyards are, uh, Putin took the former Italian president, Silvio uh, Berlusconi, on a tour of the region's vineyards and cellars. And he also, from the cellars, handed him a 1775 Jerez wine that had been brought to Crimea by Count Mikhail Vorontsov during the reign of Catherine the Great. So, wow, history there, I guess, a lot. That's um, so why you believe that Putin has personally persuaded wealthy investors to make uh, to put money into the wine industry, including in Crimea. Now, you got to remember, Crimea, I don't believe, is part of Russia, so, hmm. So, what... Uh, making new laws work, however, is proving rather tricky because uh, those who know and understand the Russian wine industry and have heard its winemakers' annual complaints about the lack of grace for wine production have really got everyone thinking, what is really happening to Russian wine? Well... <sighs> Russia is a wine-consuming and wine-importing country. Uh, according to the 2019 report, around 60% of Russians say wine is their favorite alcoholic beverage. 60%, only 36% named vodka. When you think of Russians, you think of that bottle of vodka. Well, no, it's, it's, uh, it's wine. And vodka sales have actually slipped. Uh, from a high of 2005 to now, it's about half of what it was uh, in 2005. The winemakers in the southern regions of Krasnodar Kray and Rostov Oblast and the Cr uh, Crimean vineyards uh, 
that since, well, 2014 annexation by Russia, they consider the Crimean their own now, I guess. Russians drink significantly more wine than they produce. Okay, so according to Wine and Report, wine consumption volume in Russia grew by 13.5% compound annually from 2015 to 2020. And the consumption doubled and value grew even faster to 20.9%. Wow. But the estimates are higher. Some sources say it's up to 23% of the places say it's not quite that high. It's about, you know, 18%. But the world's 10th most attractive still wine market in the world is Russia. Uh, Russian winemaking differs from other nations, though, thanks to its system, uh, to the system its industry inherited from the Soviet Union era. So it's not Soviet Union, it's Russia. The production process is separated between primary and secondary wineries. The main goal of Soviet winemaking is to provide large volumes of wine for its citizens. You noticed I did not say good wine, large volumes of wine. And as with food, the focus is on quantity and low prices rather than quality. Still wine was produced at primary wineries in areas where the grapes grew. Further operations like bottling, secondary fermentation for sparkling wines, distillation for brandy took place at secondary wineries closer to the consumer. So the wineries may be, you know, in an area where it's not dense population, but then the secondaries, they put it closer to cities and stuff. Okay, so in 2010, large sparkling wine producers were also located close to Moscow and St. Petersburg. So in the Soviet era, wine bottled in one facility might often taste quite different to wine bearing the same label from other areas. And it seems no one cared, or if they even noticed. Wine was imported in large volumes from Iron Curtain countries, and even in the case of Hungarian Tokay, it was imported in return for petrol and liter for liter basis. So give me a liter of wine, I'll give you a liter of petrol. So let me give you a trunk a truckload of wine, you'll get a truckload of petrol. And some of the areas really needed it. So, Iron Curtain collapsed. Russia fell apart, the Soviet Union fell apart. And when that happened, the bulk suppliers were severed. There wasn't any more. So, the secondary winery switched to cheap imported bulk wine from Spain and South Africa that could be labeled and sold as Russian provided, uh, as Russian provided, it was bottled in Russia. Hmm. So, say wines from La Mancha regularly switch nationality on the bottling lines of St. Petersburg. So, this Spanish wine all of a sudden becomes a uh, Russian wine. And obviously, not everyone was happy. Producers of genuinely Russian wine alleged that. A leading Russian sparkling brand produced as much as 90% of its wines from imported bulk. So that was a new problem. So in 2019, the government had listened to these complaints. And then in December of that year, it introduced a new wine law whose wording was even harsher than the producers of genuine Russian wine had expected. Well, you get what you complain about. So, it basically said, beginning in June 2020, all wines produced with imported bulk must, and concentrated must, had to be labeled as wine beverages. <laughs> and they also were displayed separately from wine in retail stores. Think about that. It's still wine. It's probably better than the wine that they're making in Russia. 
but they have to label it wine beverages and put it in a different spot. And then the article says here, then came the paradox. In the country where grape harvest, even in the best years, could satisfy only half of its own needs, wine and brandy production only slightly decreased instead of collapsing. The law directed the spotlight onto a problem previously hidden in the shadows. So no one in Russia, including the alcohol regulation body, appears to know what a quarter of Russian's wine and brandy is really made of. Hmm. Well, that's why we've never talked about Russian wine. This investigation is the first attempt to use official data to bring the information to the forefront. It basically says that Russian wines and brandy seem to be produced literally out of thin air. So, how does Russian wine production relate to the volume of Russian grapes? The task of calculating the volume of Russian wine production is not as easy as it may seem. Data is hard to gather because various agencies often don't correspond to others, so they don't know. In 2020, when the use of imported bulk wine was under a ban, the main regulator of Russian alcohol market, uh, the RAR, and it's this long Russian word which I would destroy. And let's see, Rosa, Rosal Koryagulov, no, I'll destroy it. RAR recorded the production of 334,000 hectoliters, hectoliters of Russian wine in Leningrad region, where even cucumbers have to be grown in greenhouses. But they made 334,000 hectoliters of grapes. Russian data records, uh, Russian data records all wine volume so for the clarity during this article it says a hectoliter one ton equals 10.18 hectoliters and you ask how much is a hectoliter oh my engineer just brought in a wine for me this evening oh we've had this before this is good uh yeah, this is Freak Show. Uh, Michael David Joint, it says, Freak Show Wine. It says on the back, vented and bottled by Michael David Winery, Grattan, or Grayton, California. That's it. Then it has the standard government warning, but that's all it says. Freak Show. It's a red wine. And it's very good. We've had it before. It's a, it's a very nice dark red wine. And uh, I'll take a break here and describe it to you. Oh, really nice plummy nose I'm getting out of this. I want to say I'm picking up a little bit of chocolatey nose, but I don't think so. I, I'm, the plum is just almost overpowering over everything. Yeah, very, very nice nose. Dark, dark berry. It the, the taste belies the nose and the color. You expect a little bit heavier taste to it, but it's not. It's uh, a little light. The color is dark. It's a dark garnet color. And for those of you who are into to legs on the wine, some nice legs. And nice taste. I'm, I lost the plum in the taste, but I'm picking up uh, dark berries like uh, blackberry and uh, I want to say blueberry, but not really. More blackberry than anything. 
rather short on the finish or the aftertaste. I'm not getting a real strong aftertaste, but the wine itself is a little light, so the aftertaste obviously will tend to be a little bit softer. But overall, I've had it before, and I really enjoy it. It's called Freak Show. And you can get it anywhere. I don't know how much we paid for it. I have a habit of not putting prices on my wine, which I probably should. It's a 2017 red wine, and what it says, Lodi, California. Alcohol, 15%. Wow, it doesn't present the alcohol that much on the taste. That's surprising. At 15%, you usually get a little bit more of the alcoholic taste, but that's not coming out. So that's nice. So there you go. I will have to stop every once in a while and take a sip of my wine. So one hectoliter equals 26.4172 gallons, U.S. gallons. So one ton is 10 hectoliters. So it, it would equal, what, 20, 260, 270, yeah, 270, 275 gallons, something like that. So situation today in Russia, uh, it's, the start in 2019 when imported bulk could be used to produce Russian wines and brandy. The total grape harvest that year in 2019 was 678 tons, or 678,000 tons. Now, assuming every Russian grape was used for wine rather than for the table or for juice or anything, that heavy extraction yielded 70% juice. So it would have been possible to obtain 4.834 million hectoliters of must. So whatever the quantity of Russian grapes that ended up in fermentation of that, so official data show the country importing 1.165 million hectoliter of bulk wine. Uh, but the official figure is 3.5 million. 2019, the winemakers produced 3.339 million hectoliters of still wine and 1.344 million hectoliters of sparkling wine. They also produced 2.947 million hectoliters of wine beverages. Remember I told you the rule there? Which must legally contain at least 50% of wine and thus required another 1.473 million hectoliters of bulk. So the wine beverages, again, doesn't have to be 100% wine. 50% is all that's required. So they can add fruits or water, whatever they want. Uh, so uh, calculation, including imports, managed to produce, Russia winemaker managed to produce 6.157 million hectoliters of wine. Now, the gap between the two figures is small enough to be insignificant. At least it would be if the Russian industry had not also produced volumes of another grape-based beverage, so-called Russian cognac. <laughs> Here we go again. Russian sparkling wine, or Russian champagne, Russian cognac. They, they just, they, they love doing this stuff. While the 2019 wine law gave wine producers a grace period of six months to comply, distillers of brandies were allowed seven years. So they can continue to distill and make Russian brandy and call it cognac. So the popular production has historically been labeled as cognac, provided that it was aged at least three years. So, French VS Cognac under Russian law should be called brandy, while an Uzbek distillant aged in Tashkent and bottled near Moscow bears the proud name of Russian Cognac. 
So we'll refer to it as brandy for simplicity here. So what does brandy do to this picture? In 2019, the Russian Federation produced 936 plus ton of, or 936,000 plus ton uh, hectoliter brandy. Not ton, but hectoliter. I uh, remember hectoliter 26.4. And they also distilled 65% uh, of the grapes, making 1.75 liters of brandy. And so, therefore, it appeared that 62% of Russian brandy in 2019 was made from imported distillants, diluted to consumer strength, and bottled on Russian territory. This is confirmed by the legally required declarations by both producers and importers. And there was different companies that did it near Moscow, and they made the pomp of Russian cognacs. The production of one liter of brandy requires eight liters of wine. Thus, to produce the remaining amount of brandy, Russian distillers would need another 3.016 million hectoliters of wine. So in 2020, under the, after the new law was passed, volumes of imported bulk fell dramatically. And the reduction was reflected in the drop, officially declared Russian wine production. Uh, was way down again. So once again, almost a third of the wine, beverages, and brandy produced in Russia in 2020 was produced from an unknown source. Uh, <laughs> so what is Russian wine made from? I mean, you know, I mean, we've been telling you all this unknown source stuff, but what is Russian wine made from? Well, uh, there's not enough public records to identify specific producers of wine from thin air or to name source of counterfeit wine in Russian market. The most innocent counterfeiting in the protection of Russian wine is from imported grapes. So a company may engage in the distribution of alcoholic beverages producing vodka, liquors, and wine. And the paperwork that the company hands out basically bunches it all in one category so they, it's not broken down. Uh, one company producing Russian wine in the 2021 harvest declared that it had imported 3,160 tons of Cabernet Sauvignon, Sep, uh, Saparavi, Montepulcino, etc. grapes from Ar Azerbaijan, A U Z E R B E. A I G A N Azerbaijan. So, a number of companies are from the Krasnodar region supply components for winemaking, like yeast and bentonite, different things you need. But it's a corporation with these different companies and companies and the vodka producing companies managed to make uh, Cabernet Sauvignon in their areas by just adding all the reports together, which makes it sort of like encouraging to the officials. They have seen China in recent years um, go through things like this, and finally China is very legitimate and one a, a big wine-producing market. And Russia wine industry can hopefully lay claim to its legitimacy, and Putin is hoping it does. Uh, there's a huge number of losers in the current situation, though. Those include the 150 million Russians who consume wines and spirits whose origins can't be justified by the laws of logic or legality. But other Victims include Russian winemakers facing unfair, unfair competition, importers and exporters, and who face increasing administrative barriers. So it is continuing to be uh, just a regular mess out there. 
uh, they have a chart here, which is not really worth breaking it down to and all that. But overall, Russian alcohol market is really messed up, and it has been for years and years. They don't know where grapes come from. They don't know how the grape, uh, some of the wines are made. If it doesn't contain Russian grapes, then it has to be called a wine wine beverage, and it puts it separate from all the other wines. And cognac is not really cognac, and brandy, <laughs> brandy is uh, under uh, a, another label. I, I mean, it's, the whole thing is a mess. So my question at the beginning of this was, why have I never talked about Russian wine? The answer is, that's why. It's just, it's such a mess. Most of, they have a map here showing where most of the vineyards and the the uh, uh, major vineyards are, and most of them are in uh, the southwest of the country, right down in uh, Crimea and Ukraine. And so you want to know why they're getting ready to walk into the Ukraine. They need those grapes. They need those vineyards. They you know, Putin wants to go down and get those vineyards under his control. And right now, the Ukraine's probably selling to him, and he wants to just say, those are mine. I want to take them, just like he's doing now in Crimea, since he annexed that in 2014, saying that's it. So, I don't know. That's just conjecture. Don't quote me on it. I don't know. But, you know, that could be a reasonable thing if he wants to increase his wine presence in the world. He's got to get to where the vineyards are, and those vineyards are in uh, uh, Crimea and uh, Ukraine. So, Russian wine. Uh, unbelievable story about that stuff and how they're doing it there. Ice wine. I've seen quite a few articles on ice wine. This is the time of year where they're picking it, and actually most of the picking should be done by now. This winery, uh, first one I looked at here, was uh, 12 Corners Vineyard. It's in Michigan, uh, Benton Harbor, Michigan. And they have uh, 115 acres planted with grapes. And they do regular wines here. Actually, uh, let me run through what they do uh, on uh, the grapes. They have a river dry, a river stone dry red. Doesn't say what you use. A Cabernet Franc, a Marquette, a Merlot, and a dry white Pinot Grigio, Chardonnay. And these are grapes they have on the on the dry side, on the semi sweet Gewürztraminer, Tramnet. Uh, let's see, white, reds, and all that. Those are not named as things. Sweet wines, uh, Niagara, Ar Aromella, and then on the fruit and desserts, they have uh, Niagara again, Aromella Sunset Red, and fruit and dessert wines. That should be... Yeah, here we go. Triple Berry, which is a black raspberry, blueberry and raspberry wine. Uh, Tropical Blanc and a Vidal ice wine. So they make more than just ice wines. They make a, a variety of different different wines. But it's uh, on Lake Michigan Shore. And it is 12 Corners Vineyard. And they're... Picking their, uh, their actually the ferment their grapes right now. This was a couple of weeks ago. This article came out, so they're picking their grapes right now, or fermenting their grapes right now for their ice wine. Okay, moving on to my next one here. Uh, alcohol e-commerce 
sales surpassed $6 billion in 2021. Last year, $6.1 billion in sales for e-commerce online. Oh, my gosh. Unbelievable. That is an enormous amount of sales for wine online. And they expect it to grow this year. They expect it to get even bigger in 2022. A lot of wineries are switching over to e-sales. They're promoting it as much as they can. It's proved very lucrative for a lot of them. And when they start opening up and all that, they'll still try to promote their e-sales as much as they can. But $6.1 billion in sales in 2021 for on- online sales. Wow. Okay, let's see. Uh, well, is that the only thing I wanted in this section? I don't know. Maybe. Hmm, okay. Well, that might be it for this section. Let's go to the next one. Uh, let's see. Arizona's wine grape industry is growing. We have a, a friend down in Arizona, Keith. Well, he's changed the name to his winery, but uh, Acres has doubled in Arizona. And now they have 125 bonded wineries listed for the state of Arizona. And so they are booming down there. And it's not just up in the northwest where a lot of wineries are, and a lot of them have been located for a long time, but they're all over Arizona now. They're down the southern part, and they are you know, just about everywhere. You can find wine you speckled throughout the state of Arizona and vineyards. There you have a lot of vineyards uh, with the wineries. And because of that, they have, uh, the acreage, like I say, has doubled up to 15,000, or 1,500, not 1,000, 1,500 acres. Uh, so uh, the 125 wineries, and most of them have some vineyards and stuff. And, uh, it's been it's been going well there. They did have some record rain in 2020 and in 2021 a lot of rain. In October of this past year, they had some freezes in the southeastern part of the state, but they have been recovering and everything is is doing well. So, Arizona wine industry we we never we only talked to one or two of them from down there because that's back when. We weren't uh, weren't interviewing. That might be good to call them and start interviewing. It's, well, everybody again. I haven't done that. I keep saying I'm going to, and I haven't done that. Is that the only article I wanted to tell you about on this section? I thought I had another one. Uh, hmm. Oh, the, I told you previously about Russia said that they don't want any wine shipped into the country that's labeled champagne because they want it to be Russian champagne. Well, they've eased that, and uh, there's sort of a moratorium on that situation. And because of the moratorium, it's still not completely settled, but they're negotiating. Russia says, I don't want anything in here that says champagne because we have Russian champagne. And everybody else says, no, 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 you can't do that. But, you know, Russia does what they want. Same same thing with cognac. So, okay, well, I guess this is, I thought I had a couple articles on that one. Uh, But let's see. Uh, I'll see now. Okay, grape harvesting season for ice wines is in full swing, it says in this article. And this is talking about Michigan and the wine, uh, the wineries in Michigan and what they're doing and getting their crops in. They say that they have to go out there at 
17, uh, 16 to 18 degrees, 17 degree weather and and pick grapes and take them inside and freeze them inside again and squeeze all the moisture out of it. So all this is just the juice to make their ice wines. And they said that they get enough volunteers that they usually don't have a problem with it. And <laughs> uh, what's his name? The owner of the winery. So oh, Robert Mazza, he's the president of Mazza Wineries, says, it makes some delicious wine, but it always surprises him that he has so many volunteers to come out and help him pick the grapes. So, uh, yeah, you can <laughs> you can understand his surprise. So, uh, ice wine season is coming up. If you've never had an ice wine, by all means, pick up one. They're nice for desserts. Uh, good ice wine with a cheesecake is a great, great dessert. Ice wine and cheesecake for Valentine's Day coming up. There you go. There's a there's a good idea for you. All right. I thought I had more uh more no the no and low alcohol category. I people always ask <laughs> People always ask me at the winery if I had any no alcohol wine, and I would jokingly say, "Go down to the grocery store and buy yourself a bottle of grape juice," because yeah, you know, what what is no alcohol wine but grape juice? But the actual category of no and low alcohol wine is booming. It's really caught on. Now, I have a, uh old friend of mine who uh, I rediscovered not too long ago and said that uh, she's now not drinking, and I invited her to listen to the show. And I guess low al- or no alcohol wine would be a good alternative if you're a wine drinker in, in those categories. Now, you have to watch the low alcohol because they will still have... Uh, you know, two, three percent alcohol. And I've always told people that the low alcohol and no alcohol is not good for those who are trying to avoid alcohol because there is still a little bit in it. But the no alcohol wine doesn't. It it really pretty much stripped the alcohol out. And it looks like 2022 could be a breakthrough year for those things. They're uh, becoming uh, quite a uh, quite a market. This is the 52 week period ending September 18, 2021, in the no alcohol, low alcohol category, and it's been abbreviated to no low, N O L O, no low, which is a term that's used often in the United Kingdom. So we can probably pick up on it here. The no low category grew to three point one billion dollars in off premise channel with a growth rate of ten point four percent. The three hundred and thirty one million dollar no alcohol subcategory is growing even more rapidly. Thirty three point two percent for the same period. So Oh my gosh, I mean, $3.1 billion for the Novo category is just amazing. Um, I, I never never considered. Uh, they're looking for a, uh, a, new, uh, a new taste without the alcohol. And a lot of the wineries are jumping on the bandwagon. They're trying to get part of those sales. I mean, when you're talking about billions of dollars, it's a substantial amount that you really should be trying to get to be part of the, uh, the monies. And so, um, uh, a lot of them are starting to do it. Now I'm trying to see here if it states in this article, if there's any alcohol at all, in the no alcohol category. I mean, you know, hmm, I don't know. I'll have to 
I'll have to check into that even more. I will check into the no low category and see what percentage. I don't see it in this article. This is usually. Okay, here we go. It says, uh, research continues when we see a breakthrough development along the lines of what we've seen in the beer industry. Uh, they've developed a full fermentation process that maintains flavor at a non-alcoholic labeling level, which is less than 0.5% ABV. So it still does contain alcohol. That's what I thought. And, you know, it's... And I, is that the, that can't be the no alcohol level, but it could be, I don't know. But 0.5% alcohol by volume, it looks like here, but it doesn't say if that's the the no alcohol category or the low alcohol category. Uh, uh, no, I, hmm. Well, I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to research this because that really has me wondering. So I will do just that. I will research the NOLO category. Let me make myself a note on that right now. Rat. Rat now. Research NOLO. Research... No low. Okay, good. Uh, that way I will be able to tell you what category the no alcohol falls in in the no alcohol. Hmm. Yeah. It should be zero, we would think, right? But who knows? Okay, Ice Wine Ventures. Uh, there's another article on Ice Wine. It's, uh, uh, this is talking about New York, uh, Ovid, New York. And they're talking about the insanity of going out and picking grapes at between 12 and 18 degrees outside, which is perfect temperature for picking grapes for Ice Wine. And, uh, said December's warmer temperatures in New York push back to harvesting, but a cold spell this month is perfect, and they are getting um, their grapes, their frozen grapes. About a dozen wineries in upstate New York offer ice wines, and so they're out picking them. And actually, this, this article is how old? Uh, a week. So... They probably have them all picked now and ready to put them in tanks and stuff like that. So, all over the place, all over the place is doing their their great picking for ice wine. Vidal is, seems to be a very popular great for ice wine, probably because it holds itself on the vine so well and uh, doesn't uh, fall off or have a problem. And when the grapes freeze, it takes out the moisture and that way they can... Uh, keep all the sugars in it and give the taste with all the sugars in it. That's what the ice wine is all about. Okay. No, no, okay, I just did that. Uh, wine shipments to consumers reach a record $4.2 billion in 2021, which they said is showing it's it's a little above the normal amount that they were doing before the pandemic. So it looks like it's, you know, the consumer wine shipping is jumping up, but it's a record, uh, $4.2 billion in 2021, uh, direct to consumer shipping. Uh, so that's a little bit different category than the 6.1 in 2021. It's, you know, not really comparing apples to oranges when you start looking at two numbers. A bottle of wine could cost five more dollars if you're coming out of California or most anywhere because of a glass shortage. We've talked about the supply chain problems and all that. 
now the wineries are saying it's costing us more money. We're going to have to raise the price of a bottle of wine. So five dollars, though that's sixty dollars a case. I can't see glass going up that much. So it just gives them a chance to raise a little bit. And then the question is, will they bring it back down once they start getting the glasses in? And who believes they will? Raise your hand. Oh, wait, nobody raised their hand. No, we don't think they're going to bring it back down. It gives them a chance to raise the prices. And by the time the glass starts getting back, people will be used to the new price and it will be there. So that's what happens. Uh, and so uh, one of the problems that the supply chain is doing is creating more expensive items that will probably be here forever. But uh, California's already said we're going to have to raise the prices. But then, and I tell you that, but then I look on this, and the and his remarks and presentation to the press, De Fife, and what's De Fife's first name? I don't know. Let me see here. Uh, in his remarks and presentation to the press, President Scott D. Fife stated, quote, a glass shortage is not an accurate description of the current state of the market. We understand some in-market customers may have issues with getting bottle stock, but that is not a glass shortage. So there. He said that a container glass is caught up in the same larger international logistics backlog affecting multiple industries across the United States. But domestic glass suppliers have not run out of excess inventory, nor is there any shortage of raw materials to make glass. All materials needed to manufacture glass in North America can be sourced in North America. He continues, the U.S. shipped out to customers from domestic glass plants 1.5 billion wine bottles to the third quarter of 2021. This represents a continued stability in U.S. wine shipments to customers. And he continues, glass is made from all natural, sustainable raw materials, and 88% of consumers choose to buy wine in glass, making it the preferred choice for packaging. The industry is working to make glass an even more sustainable packaging material through research and development of more lightweight bottles and developments in new glass manufacturing techniques. So, Glass Packaging Institute President Scott D. Fife said, no, there is plenty of glass. You just have to get it from the United States and from abroad. And, and you know... Uh, it's, wow, it's 8 o'clock. Let me finish with a little comment here. I had the winery. I used to source glass out of California. And there was a company out there I got it. And I got a pretty decent price on it. But then we had to ship it across the country, literally. I mean, from California, almost at the ocean where it was picked up, to here in Florida, almost at the Gulf of Mexico, where it was dropped off, we had to ship it. And so it added a, a substantial amount to my cost for the bottles of glass. And I was always trying to source glass from somewhere else. I found one out of Mexico, in Texas, actually. But when I received it, I noticed it was out of Mexico. And it was about the same price, but the shipping cost was, I, I don't want to say substantially less, but it was enough less that it really did start seeing a difference. Then right before we closed, I found another source local, and they had even better prices. I wish I'd found them years ago. I, it would have really made a big difference, but they had better price on the glass, and it was a local uh, shipment. I mean, they, they said if I wanted, I could even grab a truck and go down and pick up everything myself. Uh, although, you know, that, that might have created, you know, more cost and everything else instead of just saying, I'll just deliver it to me. I, I never got into it anymore. 
because uh, because of well, health, I had to close the winery. So I never did use them. But glass is it can be found all over the country. It, it, literally, you can find glass bottles all over the country. Specialty bottles and stuff like that are limited to different areas and different places. It's not always available everywhere. But your standard white and uh, amber green bottles and stuff like that that you normally see, you can pretty much find uh, at glass manufacturers just about anywhere in this country. So if they're sourcing glass from overseas, then number one, they need to be shocked into reality of the shipping cost has to be outrageous. They're not going to do it for free. And secondly, you can probably, especially in Napa, there's like three different glass manufacturers in Napa area alone that I know of. I found the cheapest and there's one in Oregon and two in Washington. Now these are all from what, six, seven years ago when I had the winery, but saying we've got to charge $5 more for a bottle of wine because of the glass shortage is just one way to get around charging $5 more for a bottle of wine. Uh, they blame it on the glass and everybody nods knowingly because we hear about the supply chain all the time and we don't think anything of it. And we really should not do that. We should say, wait, no, are you getting your glass off the container ships or are you getting it down the street at Napa Glassworks or something, you know, so I don't know. I, I have an issue when they start doing stuff like that, when they can source it in better places. So, all right, I think I'm done editorializing here at the end. <laughs> but that's it, some information on the Russian wine. I swear, when I just, I, I couldn't believe all the bureaucracy. Why shouldn't I believe all the bureaucracy in Russian wine? It just, it really does make sense when you think about it. It's Russia. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know. There was one thing you said about, um, what was it? The Russian government was, I don't know, lis listening to the people or, or voting on something uh, based on what the people had said. And I said, wow, since when did Russia's government care? I didn't think they did. I, I don't know. Maybe it's yeah. the way I was taught. But, uh, you know, it's like. It, you it, exactly. Yeah, me too. I know. I, I the, thought that was a little weird too. Yeah. But this wasn't of any importance, though. This was wine. And do you, yeah, well, do you want your wine from Russia or do you want your wine shipped in from who knows where? Yeah. Well, you know, if that were put to me, do you want your wine from the United States or who knows where? I'd say, well, United States, you know. Mm -hmm. and, you know yeah, so true. That could be something like that too. So. Yeah. But yeah, I don't, it's it just, it was strange, uh, that Russia, uh, has such a weird approach to the wines. I mean, uh, it's just, I, I don't know when I read that I'm thinking, well, no wonder, no wonder we don't hear much about Russian wines. But then we didn't hear much about Chinese wines until about, what, 10 years ago, 12 years ago. And Chinese wines started to explode. And, and now it's one of the biggest grape and wine-producing regions in the world. So mm -hmm. yeah. who knows? Maybe Russia can catch up. That's why they need the Ukraine, though, because all the grapes are down to the end of Ukraine, <laughs> just like Crimea. They said, we annexed Crimea. Oh, look, we got vineyards. Now we're going to annex Ukraine. Oh, look, we got vineyards. And so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, wouldn't um, surprise me. Would I guess you? we will uh, close out the show now. It's 8.07 p.m. Eastern Time. And uh, like you, you said in the beginning of the show, our next one will be in February, February the 3rd, uh, which is next Thursday. And. Uh, Thank you all next for Thursday. next Thursday. Thank you all for tuning in. And, um, yeah, we're getting close to our, uh, what anniversary? Our anniversary. Be? Is it? Nine, nine, two, six, yeah. Yeah. March. Yeah. Um, so thank you all for tuning in and we'll, we'll talk to you next week and hopefully you'll join us uh, or join us live or on the archives. It's always uh, great to have you with us. Thanks again. Be safe. Have a great right. weekend. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. Yep. Bye.
be safe. And if you're in uh, Florida or the southeast, uh, bundle up, stay warm. It's going to be a very chilly, cold, wintry, uh, blistery, um, ch- chafing, I don't know what you call it. Blustery. 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 There you go. <laughs> weekend. <Yeah>. Blustery. <laughs> Blustery weekend. Yeah. yeah. All right. Here we go. Yeah. Brawl this. <laughs> 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 this concludes tonight's broadcast of All About Wine with your host, Ron. Wine. For show information, links to All About Wine on Twitter and Facebook, or to be a guest on this show, visit the show website at www.allaboutwinebtr.com. Archive shows are available for download on iTunes or on our show page at blogtalkradio.com forward slash All About Wine. Wine. Thank you for listening. Drink responsibly, and we'll see you next time on All About Wine.